Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second of the 2019 winter webinars from the Sir James Dunn Animal Welfare Center at the Atlantic Veterinary College in the very cold Prince Edward Island, Canada. I'm Dr. Alice Crook, coordinator of the center, and I'm excited that we have registrants from far and wide again this year, Canada and the US, several European countries, South America, Australia, New Zealand, Caribbean. I want to extend a particular welcome to all those returning attendees from last year, and also to AVC alumni in the audience, as well as to the many vet students and AHT students from many different schools, to all the dog trainers and behavior people, welcome to you all. Before I introduce our presenter, I'm going to go over a few things so you will know how to participate in today's event. First, it is a good idea to close all unnecessary programs or apps running on your computer. Here's a screenshot to show you what you will see on your own computer desktop. Taking up most of the screen is the GoToWebinar viewer through which you will see the presentation. In the upper right is the GoToWebinar control panel where you can choose the audio mode and where you can ask questions. By default, you're listening in using your computer's speaker system. If you would prefer to listen over the phone, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. Note that your control panel will collapse automatically when not in use. To keep it open, you can click the view, the view menu and uncheck the auto hide control panel. Here's a closer look at the control panel and how you can participate. You have all joined the webinar in listen-only mode, which means you are muted. However, we welcome your questions or comments, which you can submit by typing them into the question pane, which is in the control panel. And you can send them in at any point, but we'll save them for the end, and Dr. Overall will address them then. Uh, note also that today's presentation is being recorded and will be sent to you in a follow-up email from GoToWebinar within a few days. And Last time I had to send the link separately, but this time I've got it all figured out and I'm sure you will receive it at the same time. Uh, all paid registrants will receive a CE certificate within about a week of the last webinar. So now it's my very great pleasure to introduce Dr. Overall to you all. Um, she's given hundreds of national and international presentations and short courses and is the author of over 100 scholarly publications, dozens of textbook chapters and the text Clinical Behavioral Medicine for Small Animals and Manual of Clinical Behavioral Medicine for Dogs and Cats, and of the DVD, Humane Behavioral Care for Dogs, Problem Prevention and Treatment. She's the Editor-in-Chief for Veterinary Behavior, for the Journal of Veterinary Behavior, Clinical Applications and Research. She is a Senior Research Scientist in the Biology Department at the University of Pennsylvania, where she studies the effects of anxiety and reactivity on performance and mental health in dogs. And I'm also really pleased to tell you that Dr. Overall is adjunct professor here at the Atlantic Veterinary College. So, Karen, I'm going to change it over to your screen now. Okay. Okay. So, can you see that? I see. I've forgotten the name <laughs> of your raven. <laughs> that is Doyle. <laughs> Yes, good old Doyle. Okay, so um, let me just, yeah, there you go. And you can see that now, everything's fine? Yep, looks good. Yeah. Okay, so you're, you're looking at, um, we're gonna talk about aggression in cats and dogs. So of course I'm showing you a picture of a raven. Um, this is Doyle whom uh, adopted us after falling out of a nest when a cat ravaged it and we're stuck with him because he's afraid of the wild. And of course, there's the lovely uh, Hamilton, the puppy whom Doyle feeds biscuits to when he's free ranging. Never a dull moment. Okay, so today, we're going to talk about what do we know about common aggressions in cats and dogs. And you'll be pleased to note, Alice, I remembered to put the AVC association there. I'd forgotten to do that last time. Okay, so without loss of generality, um, let's compare conspecific aggression. And I know this sounds like an odd place to start. You know, there are many, many, many aggressions and I'm happy to take questions on aggressive diagnoses. But when I realized what 
affects most people in most households, and we've got this hour-long webinar, it's when their pets begin to fight with each other, and that's almost always cat on cat or dog on dog. So there are good models for pathological aggressions and how to approach them because these aggressions are both complex and in both species influenced by their evolutionary history. So um, when we talk about that, you'll see the similarities and the differences. And uh, I'm going to teach you a structured way to think about approaching these aggressions in cats and these aggressions in dogs. And hopefully all of the videos that we have for this are going to show flawlessly. That's my little bit of voodoo to avoid technical difficulties. So part of the problem is that people misunderstand cats. And, you know, years ago, I used to say cats aren't small dogs. And I noticed that now a lot of people are, are saying that, but I'm not sure that we've gained in any appreciation for what cats really are. You know, um, the story of cats is the story of agrarian agriculture. Um, once humans began to settle down and um, grow crops, the crops that were stored attracted rodents. And in fact, as humans and crops moved out of Africa and through the Middle East, you see the speciation of, and movement of rodents through the Middle East. And what followed the rodents were the cats. So cats came around because humans decided to farm rather than be hunters and gatherers. And our evolutionary history with dogs, of course, has a big hunting component with dogs working cooperatively with us and living with us for a much longer period of time than, than cats did. So given this evolutionary history where, um, you know, we've had dogs, but cats have sort of had us, uh, I, there's a lot of misconception about what cats do. And everybody seems to view especially cat behavior in uh, through a lens of what the cat is doing to us or what malicious intent may be involved in um, the cat's behavior. And failing to recognize that this is, you know, a, a complex autonomous species that is of a lifestyle and size where they are both predator and prey and I think it's very important to remember, especially if you uh, live in a place, for example, where coyotes are now becoming more important in the um, urban or suburban ecosystem. Um, coyotes are quite happy to prey on cats, as are mountain lions and bobcats and pretty much anything that can get them. And that has been their evolutionary history. We tend to think of them as marauders of wildlife to some extent. And they will certainly do that um, if they have been taught to hunt by their mom and if they are hungry. But um, I think that we have to realize that what affects the way cats behave is this interesting place where they find themselves, where they've got a foot in, in both worlds of the predator and the prey. So when we come down to it, it would behoove us to ask how social cats are. Because every bit of behavior about aggression between animals within a species is all about social communication. And if people are still walking around with the impression that cats are solitary and they're not friendly and they're not social, you are not going to make any sense of the modern way of thinking about cats. So rather than imposing on a species a belief structure, I think it would behoove us to phrase our concerns and our uncertainties as hypotheses to be tested. In other words, are cats social? And if they are social, what data would allow me to perceive them as social? And if they're not social, how would I know that? 
So if they are social, what data would allow you to perceive them as social? And this is a photo of a cat. And yes, it's a black and white photo because it was taken by one of my friends 15 or 20 years ago um, at a meeting where I was talking about cat sociality and she was local. It was a British meeting. And she went home and took this beautiful black and white photo of her cats. And the reason she took this photo is because of this one cat here. And this kitten, you can see that this is quite a young kitten, had been brought into this household of three other cats the previous week. And this is how they're all already interacting. Now, is this a random conglomeration of cats? Well, I think you would have to argue no. First of all, there's some very interesting intertwining of limbs going on here. I don't know if you can appreciate that the orange guy has a, a leg under this tabby who has a leg over it. And this tabby is holding on to both of them and the kitten's wrapped around this one. And if you take a look at their eyes, um, none of these cats have dilated pupils. They all have their ears up. They're all calm and relaxed. Um, they're rubbing against each other and sharing scent. So based on, on this type of uh, solitary piece of evidence, one of the things that you could say is, yes, there is some evidence here that cats are social. They're choosing to affiliate. They were not all raised together. They're not from the same family group. They took in an older kitten. They're not aroused in each other's presence. They're doing olfactory and tactile things that would integrate them into the group. And when you see this in other situations, and um, most of the photo, the rest of the photos of cats that I'm going to show you are taken by a wonderful woman by the name of Anne-Marie Doshe, who is uh, a really good friend of my um, wonderful and beloved friend, Tini de Coyster, in Belgium. And Tini got her to take these pictures so that I could use many of them in lectures. And they are fabulous cat pictures. But um, if you look at this, these are cats who are intimate. And when you've got cats, and I don't mean that in a sexual sense, I don't even know what sex these cats are, in fact. Um, but if you look at cats who are really socially close, what you tend to see is a lot of bunting behavior. That's this head rubbing. You'll then see them rub um, their mustachial glands, which you can see happening here where this cat's uh, rubbing the glands under the whiskers against the other cat. They're uh, entwining their tails. They're doing all of this tactile stuff. And notice these are two different contexts. Um, They've continued to do this as they walk across a patio in a courtyard. So this is not just something that happens quickly. These are um, ongoing affiliative relationship building behaviors, the same way we um, as humans would cuddle or touch or attend or hold on to someone um, to build the relationship, to touch their hand when you hold someone's hand, when you're talking to them or comforting them. Those behaviors exist here. So what we need to realize is that cats are probably quite social. We know that they live in uh, matrilineal groups that are structured by who your mom and who your grandmom is. We know that those groups uh, will continue and will even take in other cats if there are sufficient resources and can be quite stable if there are no uh, abnormally aggressive cats in those groups. And if there are sufficient resources, those, those groups will um, have young that will help raise the next generation of young, a pattern that we're um, familiar with in a number of, of species and phylogenies. Um, crows and jays are quite famous for those behaviors in the bird world. And um, um, even the the cats that would leave the group, wh which are generally the young males, um, would stay for 18 to 24 months and maybe beyond and help raise offspring. And in these very stable large groups, which are uh, a number of ethologists have watched in a number of, of cities, in these very stable groups, um, these young males will even uh, suckle some of the kittens, not nutritively generally, but uh, in a comfort way. So we've got all the things necessary for cats to be social. 
but not all sociality is the same. And I think that that really is the take home message. You know, um, everybody complains about anthropomorphism, seeing animals through eyes that are ours and expecting them to have the attributes that are ours. But I'm far more concerned. I'm not a big fan of anthropomorphism. I do think it can help you make help make you more empathetic. But you've got to make sure if you're interested in science that you're not mistaking that for data. Um, but I have a massive problem with anthropocentrism, where we are at the center of everybody's universe because we're not at the center of most universes. And I think that uh, the combination of anthropocentrism and anthropomorphism for cats becomes really problematic and we never give them their due. And I think if we do so, we begin to find out some interesting things. And I don't know if anybody's been to Le Chat Noir in uh, Paris, but um, this is one of the very famous drawings that, that come from there, and they're everywhere. They're on cards, they're on posters. And I love this because this is the domestic cat and, and his, uh, his character, his behavior. And you know, here we've got the indifferent cat. And if you take a good look at all of these cats, the, the driving factor in how you can tell what the cat is thinking or feeling is the cat's tail. The eyes move, the ears move, but the tails have it here. So here we have the indifferent cat, the very decisive cat, the cat who's in a good mood. And there is something to be said for cats' tails being up because cats tail don't put their tails up unless they wish to be seen. Um, and then you go on through the, the cats who are experiencing all of these other different things. Okay, uh, it's a cute poster. It's got some features that I think are actually um, quite quite good. I'm not sure what a chagrined cat would look like. I think we might only chagrin dogs. I'm reasonably certain we don't chagrin cats. But when you look at cats as a group, you can see some of the reasons that poster came to be. And what you see here in this group of cats is that this cat's tail is all the way up. And what I want you to realize is this cat has just finished occupying this box. And um, as a result of occupying the box, uh, he's, he's getting out of it. He's put his tail up so that everybody sees him. And this tabby cat is in line for that box. The resource here is being able to sit and hide in the box for a little bit. Because this is a very old slide. This is a slide I took, I think, 20 years ago. And this is the blood donor call, what used to be the blood donor colony at the University of Pennsylvania Veterinary School. And these are the cats in it. And they live as a group. And you can see that this cat has successfully touched one, two, three, four cats at once. This cat is successfully touching at least one, two, three, four maybe touching that one. Um, this guy's tail is up, this guy's tail is up, this guy's reaching out. And you, you see a really nice orchestration. Again, nobody's got their ears back. Notice everybody's ears that you can see are up. This guy's yawning. He may be about to reach out and touch this guy. But these are all fairly calm and relaxed cats who know each other, are quite social, have good social relationships, and certainly, aren't from the same mother. So when we look at cat behavior, these are the classic Lehoisen drawings. And I love these drawings. The interpretation of them has evolved over the years as we've learned more about cat behavior. And that is not to say that Lehoisen was wrong. Um, we all stand on the shoulders of giants. And my God, if somebody says, gee, you know, I read some of Karen Overall's stuff and she sure got this wrong, but it made me think, that's it. That is the epitome of success, um, to make somebody think and to keep them interested and make them pursue more information. It's not really about being right. If you want to be right, science is the wrong place to be. But if you look at um, this cat, this is your basic copacetic cat. So when we evaluate cat behavior, what we try to teach clients to do, and this is an important part of getting them to evaluate their cats when we see them for aggression, because if they don't have a video of those cats, how good do you think their assessment of or interpretation of or description of behavior is going to be without some help? It's going to be lousy.
So what we try to do is get them to pay attention to some classical patterns. So in the copacetic cat, notice the ears are forward the way all those cats were. And the top line is pretty even. Um, cats' back legs are longer than their front legs. So if they straighten them, what you actually get is a top line that's up at the bum end. Um, but if you look at this guy, his tail is loose. It's not high. Um, he's not interested in being seen. He's not interested in not being seen. It's not an issue. So here you've got your relaxed cat, your relaxed tail, relaxed legs, um, your copacetic cat. As this cat gets more withdrawn and more concerned and more defensively aggressive, um, this cat will curl up into a ball and notice the tail is tucked. You can't see the belly. The ears are flat and you can see the backs of them. Tucked neck. This, for all intents and purposes, this cat has no feet. This cat has no belly. This cat has no tail. And uh, he has no neck. And if you were to reach out for this cat, you might be missing a finger. Um, because this cat, people say, well, which one's the fearful one and which one's the aggressive one? which is how for some reason we've come to think of dogs and every single one of these cats has some uncertainty except for this guy and some aggression in them except for this one and this is all part of being both predators and prey so they've had this unique evolutionary history as you go from left to right, you see the cat that is more uh, offensively aggressive, more assertive. And this is perhaps the more deliberate, the most deliberate, most assertive, and possibly the most overtly dangerous cat in, in this, in this uh, set of drawings because this cat uh, doesn't care. This cat is not afraid and this cat wants something. And if this cat uh, is unable to obtain his objective, which often is vanquishing another cat, um, he, will, he will be overtly aggressive attempting to do so. Uh, we've certainly seen this body form where the ears go back. The neck here is not missing. Notice how it goes missing as you become more withdrawn. You can see this neck, this neck is thicker. And this neck is thicker because all of the muscles are now showing. This is a highly aroused cat. This is a cat who is, has got its legs straightened, um, its tails puffed up, it's clamped against its butt, and it's staring at somebody. And in a cat, that is the pinnacle of a threat. Um, the thing we think of as a Halloween cat is the only cat that has his tail completely up here. And yet, look, no neck and an arched back. Well, that arched back is a function of the unique anatomy of cats that gives them that very flexible spine for the pouncing that they're going to do where you run one, two, three hops, jump, grab your your small prey items. So um, what you're seeing here is the arousal that goes with that. Uh, the cat is showing you all of its weapons. Nobody does that if they really want to attack you. This is to get you to back down, showing you all of the teeth. The ears are back, but you would see the insides of the ears. Were you able to see them in this drawing? And again, the tail is puffed up, but in a way that this isn't. This is piloerection. This is muscle. So you've got two different processes going on here. And again, the legs are up, but this is a cat who is just equally, if you allow this cat to escape, this cat will escape. Um, if you prohibit that cat from escaping and continue to pursue it, whether you are another cat, a dog, a horse, a human, that cat's going to react aggressively and lash out at whomever comes too close. If you now look at the eyes, here's that copacetic cat that was in the upper left. The cat that was in the upper right is this one, and the Halloween cat is this one. And you see that the cat who was aroused and aggressive still maintains somewhat of the oval pupil, whereas the Halloween cat's eyes are just blacked out by pupils. Um, so this is a very classic fear response, but it always has some aggression. This is the cat who withdrew, so you saw the tops of his ears, but there is still in cats some aggression. You almost never see in any of these illustrations the frank frozen withdrawal only that you can see in dogs. It's not to say that it doesn't happen in cats, but it's the rare morph of how cats behave. Again, predator and prey. Okay.
So reading the signals is important for understanding the aggression and clients who best read their cat signals in the studies that have been done and uh, Bradshaw's group out of um, Bristol did a lot of these over the years. John's now retired. Um, but a lot of the people who worked with him worked on cats. And they all did various studies that showed that people who could read their cats better uh, felt that they had a better relationship with their cats. And when they rated them, they did have a better relationship. But the interesting thing was they all thought their cats were smarter than other people's cats. So understanding the um, the individuals with, with, with whom you share your, your life, and this may pertain to your spouse, may make you think that they're smarter than others. So it's an attribution bias. I'd be a little careful, but it can help you if you need to get these, these patients some help. Um, there have been, these are British data on free ranging territories in cats and a territory is the uh, space where you will um, defend the perimeter uh, from other individuals and where you'll spend well over 95% of your time and of it, the core areas where you'll spend a true 95% of your time. So if you look at this area where they'll, they'll fend off other individuals, if you just looked at average over time, it's a 10th to a half hectare. But if you looked at males and you looked at females and you looked at them over a season, you would find out that this can range from a cat who never gets out of the barn to uh, cats that can go nearly a thousand hectares. These types of data were um, redone for suburban areas in the middle of the United States. And uh, the data are remarkably similar. In one of the United States situations, the cats ranged even further in suburbia. And it's possible because there were other food sources that they might have done that. This is a lot of space. Okay, um, half a hectare. Most of us don't have apartments or houses that are this big. So here we've got these small animals that people recommend for individuals who are too busy to walk dogs. And they're going to live largely indoors in urban areas. And in many parts of the world, living indoors is now mandatory because of threats for wildlife. Um, and this is the amount of space they would wander around normally. So you can see what might happen in a home environment. And I think we have to ask ourselves what this means for um, small living areas, 3D spaces, and personality types. Because there, are, I've just told you, cats as a species are a social species. They're not social in exactly the same way many other species are, we all differ a bit, but they are social. But there are also cats that fit beautifully on the shy, bold continuum. All of the cats I've talked about pretty much so far in pictures have been bold cats. Um, the shy cats are going to be the cats that were in the lower left corner of those postures where they're, they're more withdrawn. And when you look at these cats, you can identify them in group social situations. This is the other end of that cat colony that I showed you earlier for blood donor cats. And what you see here are these are the cats who are not that social. These are the cats who are uncomfortable in those group situations. These are the cats who are more withdrawn. And these are the cats whose needs are at risk of never being met. And if you put them in a boisterous situation like that, unless the other cats can make arrangements for these cats, these are the cats you might never see because they'll be under the sofa or they'll be under the bed or they'll be in the basement or they'll be in the attic or this will be the cat who chooses to become the outside cat where they can regulate not having to interact. So here they had some needs met and there were some other boxes and things here. And, you know, they can do limited contact, but they could easily walk out this door, walk down the hall and be with the other cats and they choose not to. Because none of these cats are overtly aggressive or overtly problematic, these are normal spectrums of feline behavior. They could all subsist well in this colony without being distressed. The bolder cats are going to be much happier in this setting. 
So let's talk about intercategression, and then you'll see how it's different from interdog aggression. And when we talk about aggression, we need to define it because everybody can define these things differently, but there is a textbook definition for aggression. And it's an appropriate or inappropriate inter or intra specific challenge, threat, or contest resulting in deference or in combat and resolution. This doesn't matter for species, okay? It's either going to be appropriate or, or inappropriate. In other words, somebody reacted to a stimulus in a contextual sense, you're attacked in a garage, you may decide to fight back. You're attacked in a garage, your dog decides to fight back. You're attacked in a garage and you're holding your cat in your arms and the cat goes after the guy who attacks you. Those are all appropriate circumstances. Inappropriate. Somebody comes to your house whom you're hoping to have stay for dinner and you give them a hug and your cat or your dog savages them. That's inappropriate. Inter or intraspecific, here we're just going to be talking about uh, within dogs and within cats. Challenge, um, it could be one-upsmanship, it could be a physical challenge, it could be a vocal challenge. Threat, where um, you increase the intensity, you snarl, you swat, you growl. Or a true contest with posturing and physical contact where somebody either defers or there is a true fight where there is somebody who loses and ultimately it resolves. Resolution could also be that nobody gives up um, so that you decide you're not going to fight anymore, but that you are going to choose not to interact. Okay, that's not the same thing as deference. Um, and context matters here because it's how you decide whether it's appropriate and whether these signals are the ones that you need it. So this is the classic ethological textbook definition. The view of cats used to consider that all aggression between cats was normal and you just had to live with it or kick the cats out of the house or um, keep the cats out of the house or get rid of one of the cats, but cats fought. Uh, and this was based on aggression between toms as a result of and the influence on the skewed sex ratio in matrilineal groups of related females. And because the males tend to disperse, you'll have one or two breeding males. They might fight with each other over access to females. In truth, we tend to have more breeding males than we think about. But this is how people perceived it because they make a lot of noise when they're mating. We know that the males are largely banished at social maturity. As I said, that can be quite late depending on the resource environment. We know that um, sex and cats um, is hormonally induced, impregnations hormonally induced, and you need spinal stimulation to induce ovulation so that uh, males who mate pretty much can be guaranteed of their paternity if another male doesn't come along and mate quickly thereafter and also stimulate the ovulation of some eggs, and that has been known to happen. But in large cats especially, but it can happen in pet cats, nursing kittens may be killed by a male who comes in and moves into and takes over uh, a new group of cats because the females will then cycle and he can inseminate them and that's best established for lions but it has happened in domestic cats and I warn people who have catteries um, that the cats if they're not handled a lot may not make a big distinction between infant animals and infant kids they're just they're if they're not handled and they're keeping them only to mate, these are now different animals and they need to be careful. The less common view is that aggression that clients complain about is largely due to conflicts in social relationships that become apparent at social maturity. Here, aggression is an abnormal behavior and we have to consider the roles of context and response. So we, we have to remember that if you've got bold and shy cats and you've got worried and non-worried cats, um, you could also have a bully cat. So we know that triads are potentially unstable. So that if you've one cat who's a little shy and a little worried and you've got a bully cat um, and you've got another bold cat who's not going to intervene, that triad could become unstable and it will seem to at least the victim cat to be two on one. Covert and passive aggression are very, very common in the early phases of intercat aggression, and the humans miss it. So we're going to talk about that. 
um, they're initially those phases, those covert and passive aggressions are more important between known cats, particularly those with unequal status, and overt and active aggression shows up later. Overt aggression is far more common between unknown cats or cats that are known, that are evenly matched and have a history. So for example, if you have outdoor cats and there's a cat that lives next door, um, overt aggression is going to be much more common with those cats as they patrol whatever boundaries they perceive are there. And those boundaries will change by resource environment, by season, by other things that matter to the cats. There is no set turf that they're going to protect. There's no value to protecting a turf. There's a value protecting something in that that might matter to them, that might help with their survival or um, their the the social patterns that matter to them. Certainly we see overt aggression to unknown cats all the time. And when vets are, are lancing abscesses, <clears throat> excuse me, and putting cats on antibiotics, almost always those are outdoor cats. They're not the cats that are indoors. That can happen, but that's not the common thing because those aggressions are more passive and covert. Okay, let me give you a bunch of examples of these. So this is how I break it down. Um, my heuristic axes are overt versus covert, active versus passive, offensive versus defensive. And um, I'm going to show you some sample scenarios. Most people use active versus passive and offensive versus defensive. I've added overt. I've always used overt and covert. I think that's very hard for people to observe, but I'll show you what it means. And I'm spending more time on cats, and I'm going to give dogs a little short shrift today because it's almost always the other way around. So here you've got some cats. Um, and I took this picture of a cat in Japan, um, and that cat is doing overt, passive, but very offensive aggression. His tail is up. Um, he's not announcing anything. He's quite overt. The aggression is passive, but he's rubbing his tail back and forth and back and forth. And why is this offensive aggression? He's staring at another set of cats who are across the temple. Um, and the male has just come out to eat and is staring at him. And you see it here. So these are um, these are not well advertised. They're passive. There's nothing active here, but this is offensive. And it all involves that stare and that stop and that stillness. It's a passive threat. And when you consider how many others attend to it, it's quite overt. Other cats may not be attending to it. Certainly humans weren't won't uh, be attending to it unless they know what they're looking for. Okay, if a cat sees this, any cat would recognize that as an overt attempted aggression. Here we have some overt passive aggression, uh, defensive aggression, where the cats are avoiding things, arched back. Here's a kitten in a lab. The less confident cat who will leave the room back up, withdrawn to a smaller space. They might vocalize. Um, they'll tuck their tail. Most people recognize overt active ag uh, offensive aggression. Everybody can see this, okay? Um, a chase, an attack, it'll use teeth. It's accompanied by vocalization. The, it could be the resident cat to a new cat. It could be a cat that is the bully to a victim cat. It could be the cat that... Um, it doesn't like the other cat towards the cat it doesn't, you know, and the, the cat the cat that it's not liked feels picked on. But you can see it here. So this is overt. Everybody can see it. It's active. You've got the active aggression and it's truly offensive. Um, here's the overt active defensive aggression where you've got the cat rolling over and trying to get away from this other cat. And of course, this is uh, overt active offensive aggression on the part of the black cat. You begin to see this get covert, and this is the reason people have trouble with overt and covert. You begin to see this get covert when you realize people are not going to be watching for the whole sequence. Um, and this will be true for other cats or dogs. If they're not there, they've missed part of it, and they will get into the middle of this and only figure out after something happens that they got into the middle of something. These cats displace or steal, um, cats toys beds food you may get uh non-elimination pheromonal marking for these cats 
The covert passive defensive aggression where you've got vanquished or less confident cats who will mark with the mustachial glands in a window. I took this picture in Hungary. Um, it's a boundary area. This cat is locked into this barn that has chicken wire and this is the only place he can mark. Other cats will be outside and they may be displaced from these areas, but this is a covert passive defensive aggression. And you'll get covert, more active offensive aggression. Again, nobody's seeing this. Nobody's here to watch this. This cat's doing this in the absence of other cats present. But he's spraying, and that's an active act. It's an offensive act, but there's nobody here to observe it. So it's covert. So a vanquished or less confident cat might mark with urine or feces in boundary areas from which they've been displaced. And you can have covert active defensive aggression. Again, nobody's here to watch this. It's an active behavior. He's actively doing something, changing the marks on a tree. But here it's defensive. He's leaving it to say, look, I'm here. Um, you've got withdrawal and marking of a restricted area by the victim cat, but he's saying, I'm here. I haven't gone away. I know you left your marks on top of mine, but I'm still here. So if you're taking the census, no, I am still in the vicinity. And when you see these integrated, you can see the whole sequence of uh, overt and covert, active and passive, defensive and offensive behaviors, depending on, on who it is. And you can see them as part of a, a, a moving picture of how these cats work out their relationships. Clearly, there is a bully cat here, and that's the black and white one. And no matter how deferential and how non-aggressive the uh, tabby cat explains that she feels, the black and white doesn't like this cat and wants this cat gone. Okay, so we're going to see the first of a couple of videos, and then we'll move on to dogs and videos, and then we'll take some questions. So um, I need to get rid of the pointer. So let me let me get down here. In theory, I need to get there. We go. Thank you. Okay, so this is a video that I took with my iPhone at a port in. Um, Portugal. I was on a road overlooking the wharf, and there's an orange cat and a black cat. And I was also playing with some features of my iPhone, so these videos are a little weird. But I want you to get a sense of how much this is a dance. Everybody wants feline aggression to resolve the way they think dog aggression resolves. Well, dog aggression doesn't resolve, and neither does cat aggression. Let me show you the second video. And you'll see the behaviors. There's the black cat. Notice the twitching of the tail, the staring. No hair, blood, teeth, and eyeballs. There's the real threat. That cat laid down, and he's still staring at the orange cat. And now you know who the bold cat is. It's the black one. And notice the orange cat is moving away. She knows that if she goes this way, I don't know what sex they are, but she knows if she goes this way, he's going to pounce. This cat has managed to mentally trap that orange cat. And they have that whole dock area. Now, I want you to think about what that potentially means for pet cats. And this is a very old video. You'll see it's on a DVD, so hang tight, of cats in a household. So think about the space cats need. Think about the overt and covert. Think about the active and passive. Think about the defensive and offensive. And think about what this means for cats who are now locked in an environment and don't have a lot of space. Who's the aggressor here? Well, the aggressor here is Mr. Orange Boy, who now seems clueless. And the reason you can't hear this deliberately, but there's now a Cocker Spaniel barking at him. Okay, and he's like, look, what did I do? What do you mean, what did you do? You've now taken this little tiny cat. Oh, but you're still reactive. You've taken this little tiny cat and the Cocker Spaniel still barking and you've pinned that cat in the corner. Here's the victim. Okay, the victim is now withdrawing backwards. And here's the passive aggression. What's this cat doing? 
settling in. And the problem here actually had nothing to do with the aggression. The complaint was that this little black and white cat is ripping all the fur out of her belly. And so when you see things like that, you ask about social environments and stressors. Do the cats fight? You ask this person who happened to be a vet student, do the cats fight? No. Go get me a video. Do these cats fight? Absolutely. And that's the role for covert, passive and active, offensive aggression, because this cat has exhibited all of it. Okay. And that cat's trapped. And it's not just that that's a small house, but that's cat's trapped. And over time, what you would see is that this cat would probably choose to move to the periphery if there were a periphery, except you've got to remember this cat was already sitting at the top of the bookcase when this the orange cat, the bully cat came in. So this cat has already moved to the periphery in the same way they would in the wild and it didn't do any good. Okay, so we'll stop that video there. I'll go back to the cats, and we'll talk about treatment, and then we'll move on and talk about dogs. And Alice wanted me to leave 10 minutes, and I'm probably going to suck them all up. Um, protect cats who need protecting. So that black and white kitty would need protecting. Remember the boldness and shyness comparison matters in treatment. Um, screen for concurrent elimination and marking complaints. Why? Because I just told you that black and white cat had uh, was plucking fur. And uh, when we have elimination complaints in households, social stressors in cats are amazing. They are super sensitive to social stressors. Social stressors trigger obsessive compulsive behaviors in cats. They trigger aggression. They trigger elimination problems. Cats are not only social, but they're sensitive. Be aware of something that's called amygdala kindling. This is an old term, but cats were one of the models for epileptic seizures. And uh, remember that there's an association for the regions of the amygdala, the part of the brain involved in reactivity and learning adaptive fear, um, where you quickly recruit a bunch of cells and that's how you get to a seizure-like state. But that's all, there's also an association with foraging style. These are sit and wait predators. We ask them to go from being absolutely deadly quiet to pouncing instantly. So there's an association between the kindling and the foraging style. And because of that, there's an association between arousal level and how they react aggressively. And you saw it happen three or four times in that short sequence I showed you with the orange cat. Structure attention and access with the goals of rewarding appropriate behavior and decreasing anxiety. So this is standard conditioning, but go slowly. All behavior mod takes time and requires imperceptible steps by our viewpoint. And then Give anti-anxiety medication. G gabapentin can be used on the aggressor and the victim. Fluoxetine is usually uh, medication for the aggressor. Clomipramine, usually for the victim, but could be for the aggressor. Buspirone is only for the victim. It tends to make uh, animals more assertive, more outgoing. Um, and that means that these cats may now put themselves in situations that they wouldn't have. They'll stand up for themselves and people will say, oh, look, they've just gotten aggressive. No, they stood up for themselves. They didn't back down. They stood there. The other cat behaved as they has always behaved. And for the first time, this cat didn't run away and an agonistic encounter may have occurred. That's very different than, quote unquote, the drug makes you aggressive, which is the way it's too often in the literature and it's wrong. Okay, so it'll change the social relationships and just bear that in mind. So that should give you some insight into the complexity that happens in feline households. Now we're gonna quickly shift gears and talk about dogs. And these are dogs that are playing. Um, and when we talk about interdog aggression, we're talking about something that's consistent, something that's volitional, something that's proactive. And it's not contextual given the social signals, the threat level or the response received. 
And it has to occur in dogs for whom a static or progressive patterns be noted and for whom the complaint does not involve a sudden change in the behavior. And this is very important because a sudden change in behavior where one dog snaps at another dog could be due to pain, it could be due to startle. This is a pattern. And when people suddenly realize their dogs aren't sitting together anymore, they're not getting along, um, and they may need help in realizing that this is the pattern. The problem is very much like the situation with cats, there are myths in dogs and people think that dogs show aggression as part of normal development. And shouldn't dogs be aggressive to each other? And shouldn't the older dog start fussing with the younger dog when the younger dog starts being an upstart? And the answer to that is no. We live in a post-dominant world. And if people would like to know more about this, there are a couple of position papers online that are referenced here, the dogwelfarecampaign.org out of the UK. And AVSAB online also has a position statement on dominance. What we see in puppies is they change from rolling, rough and tumble play, grabbing, biting, et cetera, and that changes within the first few months of life, and it can be affected by breed. There are some breeds that are grabbier than others. Um, adults will perceive that the puppies hurt them, or other pups will perceive they hurt them, and corrections occur because mistakes get made. They bite too hard, they grab too hard, they misjudge their target, they overshoot. And when somebody's had it, they usually pin or block that dog, but this is an aggression. This is what you do if you don't have opposable thumbs and using your mouth. Normal play is loud, attacks are quiet. In fact, serious fatal attacks are almost deadly quiet. Um, in play, there's starting and stopping where you get info from the environment. Puppies will sit down and watch when they're uncertain. Sitting's a stop signal in dogs, but attacks are continuous. You don't get the stop signals. In fact, it, no dog would dare sit um, in an attack because they know there won't be a stop and they'll, they won't be able to defend themselves. The key to a pathological aggression is that the response that the victim gives, it doesn't matter whether it's a dog or a cat, doesn't matter. So you never modulate your continuing aggressive response in response to the victim's deferential behaviors. And you saw that in the photos I showed you of the black and white cat and the tabby cat. So here are um, my dogs and all three of these dogs are no longer with us. This was Flash. This was Emma and this was Toby when he was a baby doesn't yet have his full canines, so he was less than six months old in these pictures. And here you see that Toby is tremendously hard on the adult dogs. Uh, Flash has his leg here. He's certainly not hurting him. This is an example of it takes a village. Emma's watching. Emma was always watching. And they're wrestling. This is normal play. This is an aggression. Flash is tired. Emma's going to take over. There, that would look like a snarl to some people. Those are normal play grins. Here we've got Toby showing you his gums. You only ever show your gums if it's not a threat. It's one of the things we can teach our clients to look for. Emma's pretty much had it with him. She has his entire face and her mouth. He's not suffering for this. And there at the end of that play bout, there are all three dogs. Okay, that's normal play. It goes back and forth, it's rough and tumble. What we see in interdog aggression are um, the things again that people miss, and those are the passive components. They're unnoticed or they're misinterpreted by clients. Uh, dogs displace each other from resting places. They control, the aggressor will try to control the activities, the access, the sites used or resources. Could be food, it could be water, it could be toileting. It could be somebody's lap, it could be a toy, it could be anything. Um, and you get threats, which are usually stares, where um, the victim avoids the aggressor. And you see these in some fairly, this is a Riviere painting, you see these in some fairly famous paintings. And if you can capture these behaviors in paintings, this is the aggressor, okay, there's the threat. This is the guy who's trying not to threaten back, but he has to keep an eye on him because he doesn't trust him. He walks away, he's looking over, there's the final snarl. Okay, and notice he's snarling, even though this dog is deferring, turned its neck and is walking away. This is Emma when she was a puppy, she was about eight months old here. This is Tess, the dog that raised her. This is Christmas time. 
And I never noticed this until we had a first major nearly to the death fight um, when Emma was a year and a half of age. Um, Tessie wouldn't share the couch with her. I thought they were sharing the couch. It's Christmas, isn't everybody sharing? I didn't see that she was staring off into space and that Tess was staring at her. I didn't see that she was that tense until I went back and looked. Tears Tessie threatening her again. These are just pictures I took of Emma at Christmas. Emma's watching her out of the corner of the eye and going away. I missed all of that. And my point is that if I missed it, clients miss it. And here's here they are the week before the fight that nearly killed Emma. And Emma's actually barking at Tess as Tess follows her across the bridge, flashes watching to see what happens. But after, and Emma had been for a swim in the stream, after she barks at Tess, Tess shakes her head, which you can see here. Trainers and popular folk will say, oh, look, shake off. It's all okay. It wasn't okay. OK, we've got to be very careful about how we interpret these behaviors temporally. She shook that and ended the interaction, but it didn't change what she did. And the next week, she sent everybody to the hospital. OK, so commonly noted but incorrectly interpreted profiles. People will tell you there's an older dog who's a bully regardless and without provocation of the younger dog, or there's a younger dog who's a determined upstart. Both of those are almost invariably wrong. Instead, what you have is a victimized dog who may be younger and often is, who's contextually appropriate, but who's perceived by the older dog to be a challenge. Why? Because the older dog has an anxiety disorder and is pathological. Um, so what we have to do here is flag the more normal appropriate behaviors by reinforcing the dog who's doing the best job of behaving appropriately given the social context. Status is generally defined by the ease of frequency of engendering deferential behaviors from others, and physical capabilities are more important as second order considerations, but they don't drive this. You could have a perfectly appropriate, partially blind, partially deaf, partially lame dog who can control every interaction in the household. Don't think that that's what's driving this. It's a second order factor, but it's not what's driving it. Don't believe these dogs can't kill each other. They can. So what I want to do is show you some videos and I have to call them up. So um, I'm going to show you the first one, which is um, a completely normal set of dogs playing and I just have to find them. These are very long patient videos, so you just have to, you just have to bear with me for two seconds while I find the exact spot, because we video um, many of our appointments, and uh, they go on for hours, so, okay, so let me just, these are um, two Dobermans, OK, in the same household, they are there for a behavior consultation. This is a place we're using a research suite here where we did a lot of cognitive testing. And that's what that equipment is. Um, and this is a great let me make this full screen. This is a great play sequence because these are big dogs. They're of a breed that many people would be afraid of. Notice that their ears aren't docked, but their tails are. I don't understand it. Nothing should be docked. Um, one of the dogs is wearing an activity collar. That is not a shock collar. That's in a collar with an accelerometer in it because I wanted to measure how much he moved. But here's the fabulous play sequence because these are things that would scare most clients. But what can you see in both of these dogs? If you take a good look at this, you can see the gums of both of these dogs when they wrestle with their mouth. You can exactly what you saw in Toby and the puppy you see here. And they trade off. There's back and forth. It's noisy. It's boisterous. Everybody has a role. And you can see the gums. So there is no worry here. That's perfectly normal play behavior. Now, compare that to this next video um, where these dogs could kill each other. And I am going to show you this sequence, which is very quick. And I'm going to show it to you from two vantage points so that you can see it. These are two bulldogs that have been fighting with each other. 
I'm sitting here, my assistant's sitting here, this is the research area, these are the clients. You can tell me who the aggressor and who the victim is. They're sniffing around all these toys. Why are all these toys here? Because I'm here, they bring them to me. Okay, there it is. Okay, I'm gonna show you the other view of this exact same situation. So you can pay attention, you know what's coming now. Dying is always an issue. Um, and the reason humans die and the reason that we worry about dying Here they are walking around. Notice that they're not interacting. Very different than the Dobies. These guys know where each other is, but there are no affiliative interactions. And notice how quick this aggression is. Watch. Okay, and there's the example, okay? Notice that one dog deferred to the other and moved away and it didn't matter. That's pathological aggression, okay? And in that short amount of time, they did enough damage that we had to wipe down the noses and patch these dogs up a little bit. So how are you gonna decide which dog is more normal and how to manage them behaviorally? Ask which dog has the ability to respond appropriately to context. Ask which dog has the ability to respond in a fluid or labile manner. Ask which dog has the ability to recover and learn from their mistakes and reward the animal that's best able to do that. And you saw which dog that is. It's the, almost invariably the dog that is getting picked on and we have to work with them. So how do we treat these? Same way we treated cats in many ways, protect, animals who need protecting. With those bulldogs, I actually recommended that they rehomed the victim. Um, they chose not to do that. They did separate them and live separately with them for well over a year uh, until they could really, as they really worked with them and gradually introduced them. And now they live with them in sort of a protected custody where there are only certain situations where they can be together. They're not best friends, but they're no longer having the aggressions. And the one that was picked on is doing a much better job of being happier. So they're happy with that outcome. I've warned them that for the rest of their lives, they could still need some protection because we don't know what's going on in the brain of the aggressor. I am so serious about this separating and protecting dogs that I'm happy to have them do the time and space share, which is what they did, because they used gates, they used doors, they used locks, and I want hooks and eyes at the top. They're $1.50 a piece. They will save your life. No child can open that door inside and outside. And the legacy of Tess living with us for the 16 years, 15 years that she did with Emma, and we had them both since puppyhood. Um, is that we still have hooks and eyes inside and outside every single door in the house. Structure attention and access with a goal of rewarding appropriate behavior. You're also giving the dog or the cat who is victimized the right to exist. Um, medications, gabapentin again, the aggressor or the victim, fluoxetine, the aggressor, clomipramine, generally the victim, but could also be the aggressor, escitalopram for the aggressor, Buspirone, again, only the victim. We discussed why they won't become more aggressive. They might become more assertive and get into different social situations with different resolutions. Alprazolam, um, I use a lot of alprazolam for victims. Again, it does not make animals aggressive. The only time you'll see enhanced aggression is if the patient already had inhibited aggression, which they now don't care about displaying. And the newer medication, Cilio, which is not yet available in Canada, but is available in the US and most of Europe. Um, and it can be used for the aggression or the victor, but it's wonderful because it's an alpha agonist that blocks the arousal. And I need to disclose that, um, I helped develop this drug for market, so I'm not unbiased. But 
it um, it has a lot of potential in these situations and we're using a lot of it with a huge amount of success because what we then blunt is that arousal phase. And you can see how in those bulldogs, if we blunted the arousal phase, we'd have done a little better. Okay. And Alice is not going to be pleased. I'm on time, but I didn't leave time for questions, but I'm still pleased to take some. Um, you have my contact information, the journal that I edit, that's what the journal looks like, the DVD, the book, the college book, and um, the North American Veterinary um, Conference Institute course is full. Um, and I know a couple of people asked about it. Um, I know there's a waiting list. Um, so if people drop out, there will be spaces, but the, it is offered regularly. And I'll stop, Alice. I'm sorry. That's okay. I was fascinating. I love all the attention to cats. <laughs> well, I decided that they always get short shrift and I wanted people to really understand them. And then I realized, oh, I'm getting way too enthusiastic about this. Um. So we have some questions, and the first ones are about cats. So if a covert defensive cat becomes became medicated, would that potentially give them enough confidence that the covert aggressive cat may no longer de desire to bully them? Yes, and that's exactly it. So, you know, um, this is all about shifting the social relationships and the balance of power. and you know, we um, we all do this in our individual lives. And, you know, we say to people, well, just screw up your courage and say no. And that's really what we're asking hmm. these cats to do. Um, so if we medicate them um, and they're able to then stand there and say, you know what, I'm not going to respond to that. I'm willing to try out some other strategies you may see a dramatic shift in that dynamic. Now, with cats who were true bullies and seriously both overtly and covertly aggressive and nasty bullies, um, you really have to medicate the aggressor. And what we hope to do is take off, you know, they're, they're, there's a reason they absolutely have to control everything. That's completely pathological behavior. They have amygdalic and cortical reactivity nonstop. And the drugs that we're choosing, um, fluoxetine, you know, plus maybe gabapentin for the cats, are all meant to damp down that glutaminergic activity and let them be less aroused and less forceful and need to control things less often. And you'll see that in other aggressions also. Okay, and the, the follow-up question was, if the covert cat, covert defensive cat is medicated and, be, and becomes confident, would that negate the need to also medicate the covert aggressive cat? It sounds like you're saying it would depend on how. It would depend on the response, yeah. And, and you know, um, people will say to me sometimes, well, why can't I just um, medicate the aggressor? Um, because the other cat's now terrified. So you've got to do something for that because he's not going to trust that other cat. Well, then that's this question. If I medicate that cat, do I have to worry about the other one? Well, if he's normal enough that he can say, okay, well, I'm willing to restructure this, fine. But if what you, you'll find out because what will happen is you medicate the, the less confident cat so that it, it is less worried and less anxious and can try out some other strategies. And if the aggression ramps up, you have the answer to your question. You need to medicate the other cat because he's now just going to keep pushing the limits of that. Okay. Now, this next question is interesting. In cats, is the play attack vocalization reversed from dogs? My thinking is that the silent cat is playing mighty hunter and that the loud cat is calling a threat. You know, that's interesting. And I think you might be right. Um, no one has looked at this but it would very much depend on the vocalization. You're thinking of the loud yelling and howling and the types of vocalizations cats make when they're distressed, but they make some softer vocalizations that no one pays any attention to. And I 
don't know if you see those in cat play because no one's looked. Um, you certainly, if the play, and it's interesting because don't forget the cats don't play the same before 12 weeks of age and after 12 weeks of age. Until 12 weeks of age, they do the rough and tumble and the bumbly stuff, and you'll hear a lot of little kitten vocalization. So you'll hear a lot of. Rawr, nah, nah, nah. You know, and the little things that kittens do after 12 weeks of age, they switch to that stealth hunter. They switch to that aggression that is much more about uh, learning and practicing predatory behavior and the pouncing and the the quiet stuff. Um, so cats, when they react to aggressions and you if you you saw the pictures but um that video where the the cat jumped on the bookshelf uh the aggressor made very little sound during that the victim made quite a lot of noise hmm. okay um there's a couple of questions about well here, okay here's one about injectable dexmedetomidine um the um the uh, asker of the question says that her experience with injectable dexmedetomidine is that cats are quite arousable even when they seem very sedate. Is this different with Cilio? Oh, that's a really good question. You have to remember Cilio is not licensed for use in cats. Um, and there is a, a pilot study, I believe, looking at taking, I don't know whether it's one-tenth the dose for dogs or one one hundredth the dose, but looking, beginning to look and seeing if that can happen. Um, if you can use it for cats successfully without having any adverse events. Um, interestingly, injectable dexmedetomidine, um, which this is the same compound, which is why this, for the people who don't know this, injectable dexmedetomidine or dexdormitor is exactly the same compound as is in the oral transmucosal version, which is cilio, the concentrations are radically different. The oral transmucosal version does not get into the systemic bloodstream in dogs to any discernible amount. Only 4% of it's recovered in systemic circulation. It all goes because of the delivery route. It sits on the gums. It goes directly to the locus ceruleus in the brainstem. And that's the region of the brain that um, activates the um, norepinephrinergic component of the sympathetic response. So when you stimulate the locus ceruleus, you get this huge pulse in norepinephrine, which then plays into the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, HPA axis, fight or flight stress response. So they're all linked. They're sort of three dancing rings there that are all interlinked. And when you blunt that, um, you blunt the first step in that process. And that's the only thing that this does. Um, injectable dexmedetomidine has highly potent systemic effects and hyperarousal is an adverse event for both cats and dogs. The question becomes, is it more common in cats? And I would argue that given the kindling phenomena we talked about that's an association and of and a consequence possibly of the the uh, sit and wait predator response and the way we've selected cats brains to be so highly aroused i haven't seen the study i don't think it exists if anybody knows of it um i'd be i'd love to see it but i would guess that those adverse events with hyper arousal are more common in cats than they are in dogs and they shouldn't occur in the oral transmucosal at the same rates because the mechanism is different okay and i actually uh, stand corrected because the person was asking they were they meant dog I mean well they said dogs they meant dogs and they didn't say cats and I somehow read cats into it so she was talking about using dexmedetomidine as causing a uh, sometimes arousal in dogs and and, and oh, it yes okay and so I've answered a question that no one asked but an interesting question and made me think of a cute hypothesis but um, yes it does happen in dogs and it doesn't seem to happen in the oral um, the big complaints that people have about the oral, um, one has to do with um, adverse events, and that's that dogs can get 
sleepy. Um, you have to give them quite a lot, most dogs, but there's the occasional dog, and I have one in my household, where you give them um, what should be a subclinical dose, and they go immediately to sleep. Um, which is not what's supposed to happen. The interesting thing is they go to sleep as long as there's no stimulation. You wake them up. You just say to them, come on, let's go. They go for walks. They jump over an agility set. They interact with all the other dogs. They're fine. And then you come back from that and they go back to sleep. So um, they seem sleepier without any active sedation. And that's the that's something that people have reported. They have not reported this atypical arousal. Um, the second class of complaints that have been widely reported have nothing to do with the drug and everything to do with the delivery system. It comes in a funky um, high-tech syringe that's highly calibrated, so you get these very tiny dosages by a dot the, on a locking complex syringe, and apparently um, the locking mechanism is difficult for some people, and people have ended up com coded in this stuff, uh, which you should wash off. But um, I think that since the FDA put out a warning about that, people have attended to the locking mechanism in a very different way and those events dropped off precipitously. Okay, and then somebody else is just asking for more information on the use of Cilio. Is there any, do you have any, you know, kind of reference to recommend about it or anything? Or? Sure. Um, it was developed, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm talking about off-label uses here. I should probably tell you what it was developed for. And there's an article in the vet record, um, a peer-reviewed article on the original double-blind placebo-controlled randomized study on this. And it was developed for the use of, um, for the treatment of profound noise fears and phobias. So this was developed, this is a compound that was meant to help dogs who react to storms, who react to fireworks, who react to gunshots. But what it addresses is that arousal phase. And if you think about it, there are huge numbers of behaviors that are distressing for dogs and cats that have arousal phases. So um, think about the dog who goes on a walk and, you know, 100 feet away, he sees another dog and he starts to bark. That's an arousal phase. That dog may be anxious or worried about other dogs. Maybe he's being jumped. Maybe he just wants to play with them. Maybe he um, doesn't like other dogs and is announcing his presence. Who knows? But that arousal component can be very problematic for people, but it can be problematic for the dog. Even if the dog is a nice dog and just wants to play, he could run into a dog who's not so nice and takes that as a threat. So we are now using this off-label for um, many situations involving arousal. Think about another common arousal problem. People have a dog who's distressed when they leave them alone. Um, that dog begins to get aroused the second the alarm goes off. They don't eat their breakfast. They don't do anything. Um, well, this is a, a medication that in combination with their daily medication may help on days when um, they must be left. So there are huge numbers uh, when you start to break down these behaviors. There are huge numbers of uses for um, local agents, because this really only goes to the locus ceruleus, it doesn't go systemically, that have new delivery systems where we may be able to parse out some of these components of aggressive or anxious responses. And it's sort of a new way of thinking about treating things, but um, it's a very sane way because we're intervening in the, pro in the phases of the problematic anxiety and reactive response, um, which is a heck of a lot better than saying, what's your favorite drug for interdog aggression? Because that's ridiculous. It's not all the same. What what receptors are you hoping to change and what's their regional brain distribution? What brain changes and behavioral changes are you hoping to affect? That's how you answer those questions. Okay, here's one. Do you have any samples of behavioral modification templates for treating inner cat aggression between two cats in a home? Absolutely, and if you want to email me, I will send that to you because they do involve the same types of gradual changes we recommend in dogs. So at some point for this to work, you have either got to be able to get the cats in a gated or crated situation and or into a harness. 
to teach them to begin to let the other one exist. I don't care if these cats ever love each other. I just want them to award each other autonomy and the right to live unmolested. And then most clients can accept that. I understand most clients want that black and white picture I showed you. We're all walking around with some sort of warped leave it to beaver mentality where everything is the peaceable kingdom. Um, that's not the world I live in. And people who want the peaceable kingdom almost always end up with a nearly dead animal. And I speak from experience, you know, having lived with one dog who was so behaviorally damaged and so neurologically damaged that she couldn't tolerate a female in the household who grew up and she'd raised that puppy and done brilliantly with it as a baby. But once she grew up, could not tolerate that. I understand that everybody wants to keep their dogs together. But when it comes down to facing the death of the one of the dogs or the death of one of the cats because of the other cat or dog, um, we have to let go of the peaceable kingdom and accept that what we could get maybe is tolerance without necessarily having affinity. And Tess and Emma, I'll tell you how the story ended. Tess and Emma lived separately within the same house and time and space shared for more than a dozen years. Um, and when Tessie became incapacitated and she died um, a week short of her 15th birthday, um, and incapacitated and quite ill. It was actually Emma who had not touched this dog for more than a dozen years, who sat next to her and watched over her and cared for her. Okay, that's, that's lovely. Um, so here's another question. For dogs with valvular heart disease, are there limitations to using Cilio the way one might not want to use injectable dexmedetomidine? This is an interesting question, and it's an important question. Um, the dosage here is so low, and less than 4% of it gets into the systemic circulation in dogs that we have used it in dogs with valvular heart disease. Now, we've done so working with the cardiologist who's treating the dog. In other words, um, everybody has to be on the same page of the playbook here. It is one of the things that is noted for caution, but this is a case where when you're only getting 4% of a compound, that's one tenth to one one hundredth of the injectable dosage that you may be able to take advantage of this. The reason for this is that um, I, and I've had this discussion with cardiologists, I worry the extent to which anxiety in these dogs may worsen their cardiac disease or may put them more at risk. And this is the same discussion I, I have had for 20 years with neurologists. And people in veterinary neurology are just beginning to come around to what it took human neurologists also a very long time to come around to. And that's that um, having a neurological condition is anxiety provoking in itself. Having a cardiac condition very likely provokes anxiety in these animals the same way that it provokes anxiety in, in humans, whether it's a cat or a dog. And we've not been really good at looking for that. Yet when we can use these low risk interventions, we often see that behaviors that we thought were normal for that dog or cat change to much more normal and much calmer behaviors. Um, and we didn't realize the extent to which their neurological or their cardiac condition was also causing them anxiety. And in, in the case of an epileptic dog, um, we may in fact, by treating their anxiety concomitantly with treating their seizure disorder, may lessen the intensity, frequency, or duration of their seizures. And you have to remember, we're doing this with medications that for many, many years were labeled as possibly lowering the seizure threshold. There's actually 
very little to no, depending on who you believe, data to support the idea that SSRIs actually do that. And I think that low doses um, delivered OTM for dexmedetomidine are going to be in the same ca in the same category for many of these cardiac diseases. And I know cardiologists are terrified of alpha agonists um, when they're given systemically. I understand that this is different. Okay. Do you see more inner dog aggression with siblings versus dogs who are not related? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, I have to say that in my patient population, I do not because I actually don't see that many siblings. And I think that what happens um, and we've we've got some, you know, we've got we've got a um, a pair of males right now. Yeah. Um, but I think that when we think that that may be an attribution bias, in the literature, and there are only two studies that have really looked well at interdog aggression relationships, and we actually have enough data now to really look at this also, and I just need a graduate student or a resident or uh, a surf who is willing to plow through this and look at it because we've even got the videos to go with most of these dogs. But um, what has been found is that this is interdog, true interdog aggression, the way I defined it, where it's about social relationships and these dogs aren't afraid of each other. You know, this isn't about fear, this is about how we interact and who's allowed to exist. Um, Females, it tends to be 90% female, female, 10% male, male. Um, and I think that when we see siblings, it's probably uh, something we note, but you would have to be able to look at the number of people who have sibling dogs anyway, and then ask if interdog aggression is overrepresented compared to that in the population at large. And I would hypothesize that it's not. Alice? Alice? Sorry, Karen, I had, uh, <laughs> I had muted myself because I was answering some of the questions and I didn't want oh, people typing. That's okay. perfect, but all of a sudden it went very dead and I thought, oh no, atmospheric event. <laughs> no, it wasn't that, it was just me. Um, so this is the last question. I have used the injectable form of dexmedetomidine sublingually with aggressive dogs coming into the clinic for procedures that are painful, etc. very successfully. Do you think it will be coming on label here soon? And I don't know if this is someone from Canada. It's got to be somebody from Canada um, okay. because a lot of people are using, you know, they're making up their own concoctions either with uh, gels or dilution sublingually and um, I know I don't know because um, I do the science part they pay me by the hour for my opinion sometimes drug companies choose to ignore that and pet food companies choose to ignore that sometimes they don't um, and I go away I mean I don't do any of the marketing and I don't do any of the non-science stuff so I do none of this this type of where, how do we get it to these places? I do know that um, Zoetis, who is distributing this, would like to have it in Canada. And they've told me, and I asked again recently at North American Veterinary Conference, and, and you know, the answer is we're hoping that that's coming. Um, this is uh, a drug I wish was in everybody's armamentum because I think it has a real place. Um, it's outrageously expensive because of the delivery apparatus, and um, that's a, a real limitation for the Zoetis people. So I don't know how hard they're going to push for that. Um, and it's licensed by a different company in, in Europe. So it's a slightly different situation, but I hope so. I've been told that that is the plan and that would certainly make life a lot easier and allow you to let the clients use it at home, which this way doesn't exactly do. But I understand that the principle is similar, if not identical. 
Okay, and actually there's one more question, which I think is a good one. So this will be the last question. Is the takeaway on interdog aggression in households that almost all fighting is pathological? It's an interesting question, and I deliberately fudged on that in the slides. Um, and I think that it has to be a level of fighting. Notice that what I keep saying is each individual has to have autonomy. They have to have the right to exist. I don't think all fighting is pathological. I think that dogs and cats cannot like each other and be constrained to live together because we tend to pick up dogs and cats like potato chips. You know, nobody has just one. Um, and we put we put them together and expect that they'll like each other. I can just imagine if we collected our spouses or our children that way, what would happen? I think that you can have dogs and cats that snark at each other and that choose not to affiliate and can be a pain in the butt to each other and never, ever have frank, overt, pathological aggression. And that's the piece that I think everybody misses. And I've never actually given a lecture on that, and maybe I should, because I think that it's okay if dogs don't like each other or don't love each other. I love when they get along, but, um, you know, like with Emma and Tess, Emma realized that Tess was going to kill her, didn't seem to bear her any ill will, was just relieved to have her life where she could live safely and joyously and she got along with the other dogs and she raised the puppies beautifully and was tremendously happy. Notice that Tess wasn't in any of those pictures with, with Toby being raised. Toby never actually got to meet Tess except through a gate um, until she was very debilitated. But you know, you can have a dog who blossoms even under those conditions and doesn't have to dislike or hate the other dog when there is a pathology involved. But I think that we have to accept that if these dogs and cats are as cognitive and social as we think, they're not all going to like each other equally and they may not like the combinations we pick. And we need to make adjustments for them so that under those conditions they can have the richest and fullest life. And that doesn't necessarily need to lead to pathology. Well, that's a great note to wind up on. It's been fascinating. Um, thank you very much, Karen. And thank, thank you, you Alice. Thank you to everybody who's been listening, and we'll see many of you again in two weeks, March the 12th, for the third and final webinar, Emergent Data in Behavioral Medicine, 10 Findings That Will Change the Way You Think and Practice. So, thanks, Karen. I'm going to turn it off now, and thank you to everybody. Thank you. Okay, bye. Bye-bye.